Hey, welcome. Let's get started. I'm Ben Paul. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Welcome to our first public lecture of the spring semester. Uh, very happy that you can join us, that we can be here in person, or that you can join us online as well. Uh, we're really pleased to have Will Luther here talk to us tonight. Before I introduce him, I will mention briefly the uh, other events that we have coming up. This is the first of three lectures this semester. The next one will be on March 23rd with Bart Wilson. We'll be talking about his new book, The Property Species, Mine, Yours, and the Human Mind. Uh, that'll be on Tuesday, March 23rd, after the week formerly known as Spring Break here at Texas Tech. Uh, also over here at the same time. And then in April, uh, we're really looking forward to having Yenmi Park here. Uh, she wrote a book called In Order to Live. She, as a young girl, was born in North Korea and escaped from there and wrote a book about it and will be here to lecture for us about that in April. Tonight, of course, we're talking about is Bitcoin a bubble? And we are very pleased to have Will Luther with us. Uh, Will is an assistant professor of economics at Florida Atlantic University. He's the director of the American Institute for Economic Research's Sound Money Project and an adjunct scholar with the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Autonomies. His popular writings have appeared in The Economist, Forbes, and U.S. News and World Report. His work has been featured in major media outlets including NPR, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, Time Magazine, National Review, Fox Nation, and Vice News. He also might be one of the leading publishers in economics on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. By my count, most recently he's published 14 research uh, studies of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in places like the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, Economic Inquiry, and numerous other journals. Uh, given Bitcoin's recent rise, this topic should be of interest. Uh, and while Will is a, a leading academic studier of Bitcoin, I do not know if he was an early investor. Uh, maybe he will fill us in on that during his talk. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Will Luther. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so every time the price of Bitcoin shoots up, we hear the same thing from the financial press. But Bitcoin is a bubble. Again and again, every single time, right? So in December 2017, the price shoots up to almost $20,000. Bitcoin is a bubble. And then it falls down, and what do they say? Ah, we told you, Bitcoin is a bubble. Then it shoots up again, most recently, to yep. over $40,000 in January. Bitcoin is a bubble. And it starts to fall, and today, around $37,000. See, we told you Bitcoin is a bubble. Now, the problem with this, what I call the naive view of bubbles, it doesn't take into account the standard definition that economists use of a bubble. Because when economists refer to a bubble, they're talking about a situation where the price of an asset exceeds the fundamental value of that asset. When we look at a chart like this, we're just looking at the price. We're not looking at the fundamental value. It's possible, it's conceivable, that the fundamental value has gone up even more than the price, or perhaps in lockstep with the price. We can't just look at a rising price and say, ah, yes, this in and of itself is evidence of a bubble. And so what I would like to do today is to just consider the alternative. I want to ask if it's possible, if it's possible that what we're observing here is just shocks that are changing the fundamental value of Bitcoin. Now, this won't rule out the prospect that there's a bubble, but it will at least take us past that naive view of seeing a price chart like this and just assuming that there must be a bubble. Now, I understand that a lot of people here uh, are perhaps familiar with Bitcoin and other folks perhaps not. And so we'll start off with a very best basic question. What is Bitcoin? Try to get a sense of what this technology actually is. And then we'll talk about the fundamental value of Bitcoin. What, what is the value of Bitcoin? And then we'll consider why its price fluctuates so much. So we're going from soup to nuts here. Wherever you're at, uh, uh, we will find a good starting place for you. And hopefully by the end of the, uh, the six hours here, you'll have a really good understanding of 
of Bitcoin. Okay, so let's start at the top. What is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is an unbacked digital currency. It's unbacked. It means it's not redeemable for anything. It's not a contractual obligation to hand over some valuable asset if you show up with Bitcoin. Right? And so that means it's not like historical monies. Historical monies like bank-issued banknotes, which were a contractual obligation to, for that bank to redeem those circulating banknotes for some pre-specified quantity of gold or silver. Right? It's much more like the kind of monies that you and I use every day, like the dollar or the euro. What economists call fiat monies, or if we want to use really fancy language, intrinsically useless monies. That is, monies that we either use as a medium of exchange, that is to make transactions, or we don't use at all. They don't really have any other purpose. They are either useful as a medium of exchange, or not. And these kinds of monies, they're not redeemable. There's no contractual obligation to redeem. But they might be exchangeable. That is, people might willingly hand over valuable goods and services in exchange for these items, just like we do with dollars. All right, so Bitcoin is an unbacked digital currency. It's also a digital currency. That is, they only exist online. Now, if you take a close look at this picture here, you'll see some physical Bitcoins. But these aren't actually Bitcoins. These are just some tokens that someone has minted up. Uh, if you look on the back of those coins, there's a holographic seal. If you were to peel back that seal, there's actually a digital address where that balance of Bitcoin is located. Of course, if, you, if you've done this, you've completely ruined the item. <laughs> because now that you have, know the digital address, you can transfer that balance away from that digital, uh, uh, that digital address. And so you just have a, a metal coin at that point that uh, isn't worth much of anything. So Bitcoin is an unbacked digital currency. Now, the thing that's new and different about Bitcoin is not that it's unbacked and not that it's digital. We have other unbacked monies. We have other digital monies. The thing that's new and different about Bitcoin is the way that it processes transactions. We've got a lot of monetary economists in the room. Folks interested in payments? No? All right, so you probably don't think a lot about processing transactions, but actually the way that transactions get processed is very important. So there are three ways that we might process a transaction. Think about a simple cash transaction. A cash transaction is, is using what we call a decentralized clearing mechanism. Right? So if two people are parties to a, a transaction where they're using cash, right? this gentleman under, what's your name? Angelo. Angelo? So if I were to buy some alpaca socks from Angelo, and I pay him with cash, Angelo, you accept cash? Yeah. Good thing. So this cash, this physical cash, has some unique properties. Right? When I pull that cash out of my wallet, Angelo can immediately recognize that I am in possession of that balance of cash. And when I hand that cash to him, it exits my hand and enters his. Right? He knows that he now has received that cash. My wallet has been debited, his wallet has been credited. And there's a third nice property about a physical cash. Right? That is, once I give him that cash, I can't spend it again, because I no longer have access to that. And so with cash, we use this decentralized clearing mechanism. By that I mean, Angelo and I, we process the transaction between us. We don't need some trusted third party to process this transaction. It clears itself. Compare that with, say, if I were to write a check, Angelo, would you accept the check? Mm -hmm. A very trusting fellow. Yes. Credit worthy, no word. No, no clear. So if I were to write Angelo a check, right now, right now we need a third party to clear this transaction. We're going to rely on a centralized clearing mechanism, namely our bank. So our bank will verify that I have the funds, debit my account, credit his account, and importantly, make sure that I don't spend this balance again by giving him those uh, access to those funds and taking access away from me. That's a centralized clearing mechanism. Right? We're relying on some trusted third party, some central node to clear the payment between us as opposed to just clearing it ourselves. Now, perhaps Angelo and I, we don't have the same bank. 
if we have different banks, but that just means that the centralized clearing takes up a level uh, uh, higher at the clearinghouse interbank payment system. So now we need an entity to debit my bank's account and credit his bank's account so that we can process this transaction. But with that centralized clearing mechanism, we have some trusted third party that clears the transaction. Now, before 2009, we had two ways of processing transactions. But with Bitcoin, we got a third way to process transactions. Great. We can process these transactions using a distributed clearing mechanism. With a distributed clearing mechanism, we face the same problem. We have some ledger. We need to debit my account and credit Angelo's account. But instead of relying on some physical asset to take care of that, as we might with a decentralized clearing mechanism, or some trusted third party like a bank or a clearinghouse to take care of this, instead the whole system running the protocol is going to update this ledger through uh, uh, some consensus mechanism. Right? So Bitcoin at its core is just a shared ledger and a, a rule for how that ledger gets updated when transactions are made. Right, we'll talk a little bit more about how that actually works in a moment, uh, but for now, that'll do. So, we have an idea. We have an idea about how Bitcoin transactions are processed. Right, we have a sense of what Bitcoin is. Right, it's an unbacked digital currency that relies on a distributed clearing mechanism. But why is it valuable? Why is it valuable? Why does anybody pay for Bitcoin? Why do people hand over valuable goods and services in exchange for Bitcoin? What's the fundamental value there? Well, sometimes it's helpful to think about the wrong answers, especially if those wrong answers are common. So one answer you'll hear is that Bitcoin is valuable because it's costly to produce. And there's a grain of truth there. Bitcoin is costly to produce, but that's not the source of its value. So let's start with thinking about why it's costly to produce Bitcoin. So when you make a transaction of Bitcoin, when you make a transaction of Bitcoin, you announce that transaction to the world, and then all of the computers running the Bitcoin protocol begin racing to take that transaction and the other transactions that have been made in roughly the last 10 minutes and add that block of transactions to the preceding block of transactions, which itself has changed the block of transactions before that, and so on and so forth. That is, we're trying to add this block of transactions to the block of all previous transactions. This is what I mean when we say updating the ledger. Right? Because these transactions reflect the most recent accounts that have been debited and credited. And so this is how we're updating the ledger. One of those machines will be the first to process this batch of transactions. And when it does so, that batch of that block will be added to the chain of blocks, the blockchain, and the ledger will be updated. Now this is costly to do, and we do it about every 10 minutes. It's costly because in order to process this transaction, those machines are racing to solve a computing problem. So they have to use their machines, and they have to use electricity. And so there are costs incurred. And so in order to encourage people and to provide them with an incentive to actually process transactions, the machine that is the first to process a batch of transactions is awarded a new balance of Bitcoin. That is Bitcoin that's never existed before. And so that's why we say that it's costly to produce Bitcoin. Because Bitcoins are created in the process of processing transactions. And the process of processing transactions is costly. But again, just because it's costly, and just because that part of this claim is true, does not make the whole claim true. Bitcoin is costly to produce, but that's not the source of its value. Right? So, I always tell my students, you should never reason from cost to value. You should always reason from value to cost. Doctors, right? doctors, <coughs> medical doctors, not fake doctors like me, right? medical doctors. They make a lot more money than plumbers. And if you ask a regular person on the street, they'll probably give you an answer like, well, it's because they spend a lot of time in school. But if plumbers spend more time in school, would that make plumbers' salaries go up? At the end of the day, they're still plumbing. 
And we're still only willing to pay how much we value those plumbing services. And so, in fact, we've got the argument the, the wrong way around. The reason that doctors spend so much time in school is because we value medical services. And in order to provide those medical services, they have to get that medical training. And it's worth them incurring those costs because those medical services are valuable. And so it's not that the services are valuable because of the costs. It's that the costs are incurred because of the value. And it's the same with Bitcoin. It's not that Bitcoins are valuable because they're costly to produce. It's that these miners are running their machines and using electricity in search of Bitcoin. And they're incurring those costs because the Bitcoin is valuable. And so we need something more to explain why that Bitcoin is valuable. Another answer that you hear a lot is that Bitcoin is only valuable because of speculation. And again, there's some truth here. Is there speculation in the market for Bitcoin? Absolutely. Of course there is. Because there is always speculation in every market. It's hard to think of anything that we do that doesn't involve some speculation. I think there are some students in the room. We've got some Texas Tech students. Yeah, a few. Okay. I suspect if you're anything like my very bright students at FAU, that many of you have chosen to sacrifice four in some cases, five years of your lives pursuing an undergraduate degree because you believe that if you do so, it will enable you to get a job that pays you a higher salary than you would have, than you would have gotten if you hadn't gotten that degree. Is that a fair assessment? Do you know what job you're going to get? Do you know exactly what that salary is going to be or even what company? No. You're taking an educated guess. That's the only available information that you have. Because you're speculating. And of course you're speculating. You have to speculate. Because the future is in some sense unknown and unknowable. And so we're forced to speculate about every decision that we make. And so yeah, there's speculation in the market, in the market for Bitcoin. But the question is whether that's unfounded speculation. Or whether or not it's based on some underlying fundamentals. So I want to make this very clear. Bitcoin is valuable as a medium of exchange. That is, it's valuable to the extent that it's useful as a medium of exchange today, or is expected to be useful as a medium of exchange in the future. That's the fundamental value of Bitcoin. And what else could it be, right? This is the only thing we can use it for. We either use it to make transactions or nothing. And so the fundamental value of Bitcoin is its usefulness as a medium of exchange. Now, some people, some people who argue that Bitcoin is a bubble, they'll say, oh yeah, but Bitcoin, we can just look at the price because it's useless. It's useless. So the fundamental value is zero. To these people I say, if a little over a decade ago, I told you that I had a technology that allowed you to transfer a balance of funds virtually anywhere around the world, almost instantaneously, at a relatively low cost, would you have said, yeah, that's worthless? Now, there's some chance that it will be worthless. That is, maybe we'll find an even better way to do that. But it's not obvious that it's worthless. It's certainly not as obvious that it's worthless, that uh, as pronouncements that any upward movement in the price indicates it's a bubble would suggest. If it's useful as a medium of exchange today, or is expected to be useful as a medium of exchange in the future, then it has some fundamental value. Okay, so this is really why we're here, right? People want to think about why the price of Bitcoin is fluctuating. And so what I want to ask is, is it plausible, is it plausible that the price fluctuation that we're seeing is driven by real changes in the fundamentals, right? changes in the value of Bitcoin? 
Right? And again, to be clear, this does not rule out the prospect that, they're, that the, the price of Bitcoin is in fact greater than the fundamental value. It's really hard to assess the fundamental value of Bitcoin so precisely. But we want to at least consider the prospect that when we see these big price changes, that they might be driven by fundamentals. So, is it, is it possible? What would that mean? Well, we would get fundamental fluctuation, that is, fluctuation in the fundamental value. If we think about Bitcoin's fundamental value, right? if Bitcoin is valuable insofar as it's useful as a medium of exchange today, or is expected to be useful as a medium of exchange at some point in the future, then anything that makes it more useful as a medium of exchange, or anything that makes it more likely that it will be useful as a medium of exchange at some point in the future, will tend to increase the demand today, and hence drive up the price. And likewise, anything that makes us think that Bitcoin is less useful as a medium of exchange today, or decreases the likelihood, or our, expected, uh, uh, our expectation of the likelihood, that it will be useful as a medium of exchange in the future, will tend to decrease demand and therefore lower the price. Now, this is true about any market. We're just talking about supply and demand. And in fact, for Bitcoin, we're really just talking about demand, because the supply of Bitcoin is roughly fixed. And so we're just talking about demand shocks. So, but in the market for Bitcoin, we see huge changes in the price. So if we have a demand shock, we also have to explain why that demand shock would have such a big effect on the price. Why are the demand swings so big? And there are two reasons why. The first is what economists call network effects. How many of you woke up today and thought, what currency will I use today? Nobody, right? That's a crazy question. You're in Lubbock, Texas. Everyone in Lubbock is using the dollar. All of the trading partners that you might have encountered today are dollar users. If you don't use the dollar, you look like a fool. I see some students in here, right? So, the weekend is coming, you might show up to the convenience store and pull out a, a, a nice uh, uh, sixer of Miller High Life, like a classic crew. And you get up to the counter, and they give you the total, and you say, do you accept euros? And I'll say, what? This is America. They don't accept euros. <clears throat> because none of their trading partners accept euros. And of course, you know this, so you don't even think about it. Of course you're going to accept dollars, because you're in the dollar network, and all of your trading partners are in the dollar network, and that network effect is very strong. So what does that mean in terms of demand shocks? Well, it means if everyone wants to be in the network, or not in the network, if no one else is in the network, then any change in your demand for Bitcoin is going to affect my demand for Bitcoin. Because if you stop taking it, or the likelihood that you will take it in the future decreases, then I should stop taking it or reduce the likelihood that I will take it in the future as well. Right? If you're not going to be in the network, I don't want to be in the network. And so any change that makes it less likely that you're in the network, I'm going to adjust to that too. And then so is the next person, because now we have left the network on the margin. And so the next person exits. And so a relatively small shock can have a big effect because of these network effects. Likewise, if suddenly I start accepting Bitcoin, it makes it much more attractive for you to accept Bitcoin, which makes it much more attractive for others to accept Bitcoin. And so there are these demand spillovers, such that a relatively small shock to demand can actually have a big effect at the market level. Here's another thing about Bitcoin that causes these demand shocks to be potentially large. Bitcoin uh, does not have government support doesn't have government support. So the dollar has government support. The US government says, we're going to make all of our purchases in dollars. We're going to pay all of our employees in dollars. We're going to collect taxes in dollars. That provides a big, stable source of demand. And if we think about the folks who are interacting with the people involved in that big, stable source of demand, their demand is also going to be pretty stable because they can always reasonably expect that those people directly connected to the government will uh, use dollars, and so they can be pretty confident in using dollars as well. 
And so to the extent that there are demand shocks for the dollar, right, they're just at the edges. They're never going to encroach, they're very unlikely to encroach on that core demand support. Right? So we're just getting minor fluctuations for the dollar. But with Bitcoin, there is no big stable source of demand. Demand can go to zero. And so again, those demand shocks, they're not just like demand shocks for the dollar, they're potentially large swings in demand. Because there's no core, core source of demand for Bitcoin like there is for a government-issued currency. Okay, so here's the biggest price change recently. Right, in December, in December, the price of Bitcoin shot up. Right, if we go back to October, uh, one Bitcoin was around $12,000, and in January, $40,000. Now, typical view, this is a bubble. Well, we just wash our hands, we see the price go up, must be a bubble. But we should probably ask, is there anything any big event in the payments world in early December that might, that might have increased the fundamental value of Bitcoin? Is there any big shock that might reasonably have increased the demand for Bitcoin? Anything we can think about? This is going to be very awkward. Just warning you in advance, because I know what's coming. <laughs> And I just want to tell you that it's more awkward for me than it is for you. The answer is Pornhub. Yeah, you weren't expecting that, huh? Bear with me because it's going to get more awkward before it gets less awkward. <laughs> so, on December 4th, Nicholas Kristof published an article in the New York Times. Suddenly everybody's attention. Look at this. Wow, he peaked up. We don't want to be talking about payments, huh? Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times publishes an article which is just a very strong review of Pornhub. And we want to be clear that, that in this article, Kristof makes two distinct complaints. First, he says that Pornhub is involved in illegal activity. Illegal activity like hosting child pornography and uh, hosting revenge porn. Right? In some jurisdictions, that's illegal. He also accuses Pornhub of, uh, of um, what we might call repugnant, repugnant activities. Right? These are things like uh, racist and misogynist content. And I want to be very clear at the outset, whether we think this is good or bad, it's a thing. It happened. Right? What happened next? Well, activist investor Bill Ackman takes to Twitter. And Ackman he, he calls for Amex, MasterCard, and Visa to stop processing payments for Pornhub. Now, Nicholas Kristof retweets this, and it's uh, evidence that sometimes even the New York Times doesn't engage in good investigative journalism because Amex wasn't processing payments for Pornhub or any adult site uh, um, uh, at this time. They have a policy of uh, not processing transactions for the for adult sites. So really, it should have just been a call for MasterCard, Visa, and Discover, and actually a point of payment processors. Right? And by December 10th, around 2 p.m., MasterCard announced that it was no longer going to process transactions for Pornhub. Right? Ackman, again, he says, how about you, Visa? And by the end of the day, on December 10th, Visa had cut off Pornhub as well. At which point, Ackman says, Discover Card, do you intend to be the exclusive payment provider, the payment system for Pornhub? And the next day, Discover answered clearly by stopping uh, its processing of payments for Pornhub. So from December 4th, when the article appeared, to December 12th, uh, sorry, December 11th, uh, Pornhub calls all of its traditional payment processors. And in particular, on December 10th and December 11th, it lost its payment processors. Now, I said that very carefully. I said that Pornhub lost its traditional payment processors. Because Pornhub was still accepting payments. They were accepting payments in cryptocurrencies. 
In fact, on December 11th, when it lost uh, Discover, um, it was accepting payments in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Dash, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin, Monero, and several others. Now, of these, Bitcoin is by far the most popular. Right? In fact, if you took the market capitalization of Bitcoin, that's the, the price of Bitcoin times all coins outstanding, and compared it to the market capitalization of the other uh, cryptocurrencies that Pornhub was accepting, the market capitalization of Bitcoin was more than three times bigger than all of the others combined. Right? So Bitcoin is really the, 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 the big uh, um, payment um, processor here. Right? It's the payment technology uh, in this market at that point. All right, so again, we can talk about whether this is a uh, you know, Visa and MasterCard cutting off um, uh, and, and Discover cutting off Pornhub is a good thing or a bad thing, but certainly it's a thing. It's a thing that happened. And what should we expect it to do to the price of Bitcoin? Well, there's a direct and an indirect effect here. Right? The direct effect is that now anyone who wants to subscribe to this site, it's a very popular site, right? ranks 10th in the world by page views. Right now, they have to use a cryptocurrency if they want to continue those subscriptions. But there's also an indirect effect here. I actually think the indirect effect is probably bigger. To explain the indirect effect, let me tell you a, a completely different story. A story I feel much more comfortable telling you. A, a few years ago, I moved to South Florida. I moved there from Ohio. And the first month I was in South Florida, oh, incredible. Sunshine every single day. Every day. And then one day, about a month after I arrived, it rained very, very hard. And I thought to myself, I need to get myself an umbrella. Now, was I buying an umbrella because it was raining that day? No, I didn't have anywhere to go that day. I was buying an umbrella because I updated my expectations. It was now very clear to me that this is the kind of place that gets some pretty heavy rain, and so I am going to want an umbrella. And I think that there were a lot of people, perhaps weren't even involved in this market as, at all, who saw this happen, saw traditional payment processors cut off a merchant completely from the traditional financial system. And some of those people, they said, right, I'm not in that market. Right? I don't need Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency to make transactions this time. But now I know I live in a world where traditional payment processors can cut off a merchant at some point in the future. And I might want to transact with that merchant. Again, maybe not this merchant, but maybe the next merchant that gets cut off. Keep in mind that that original article, it made two claims. The first was that there was illegal activity. The second was that there was repugnant behavior. And so perhaps you, you, you don't like the illegal behavior, but you think, repugnant behavior? Well, if it's between consenting adults, eh, let them do their own thing. There was no criminal investigation here. There was no issue from the Justice Department. Right? This was just the payment processors cutting off a merchant. Now, you might argue that they had to do this, and in fact, legally, I think they did have to do this, because if they are aware that there is criminal activity going on, and they are facilitating those transactions, then they are facilitating illegal transactions, and so they too are liable. So perhaps they have no choice here. But for just regular folks in the market for Bitcoin, they now know that they live in a world where traditional payment processors can cut off merchants because of illegal or uh, even perhaps repugnant behavior in the future. So, that makes Bitcoin a more attractive payment mechanism today if you're involved in uh, this, uh, these transactions. And it also increases the likelihood that Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies will be useful as medium of, a medium of exchange in the future right? if these shutoffs continue to occur. All right, we take a look at this price. Right, right there, December 10th, December 11th, the price of Bitcoin starts to pick up. Now, is this clear evidence that Bitcoin's not a bubble? Absolutely not. 
I can't be any more clear about that. Maybe the fundamental value of Bitcoin went up a little bit, but the price went up even higher. Or maybe the price didn't go up enough. We don't observe the fundamental value of Bitcoin. It's very difficult to estimate the fundamental value of Bitcoin. But certainly before we jump to the conclusion that any increase in the price is evidence of a bubble, we should at least stop to consider whether it's plausible that we're just observing fluctuations in price driven by fundamental shocks to the economy. All right, so that's it for me. I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, and so I hope you have some good ones.